What's up, Jordan? Jordan, talk to me. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. I don't know what just happened. Figured that out the whole time. I mean, I, I unmuted myself. I said hi, and then you didn't respond. So I was like, oh, I don't know. Not, yeah, I didn't hear anything that first time around. Okay, now I think it's working. Uh, I'm still <laughs> quite new with this. Yeah, I mean, I can't do anything fancy, and I still can't stand how my screen just freezes like all the time, like right now. Yeah. So, but not uh, nearly as many people registered for this one this time. I mean, well, last week we had. 15 or 16 people at max and it said oh there we go so hello what's up conj it's coming connected with her through the week and got her to join there when she comes around you guys should totally turn your cameras on so i'm not just staring at my own frozen face <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i'm just huddled under a bunch of blank nice right now very cool um i'm sharing like whoops, sorry i'm sharing my workspace with a couple of people which is why i turned my camera off i'm oh. not sure i'm gonna come in and out that's fair <laughs> sorry about that but i was just telling jordan here that yeah this time around there's way less people actually registered so i'm gonna see if anybody else is coming like the first week we had 16 people show up and 21 registered, I think. I just checked and there were only four registered this time. So, I don't know. Also didn't put nearly as many posts up about it either. <laughs> so, I don't know if that's it or not. Um, with the uh, recording part. So, so we'll kind of, oops, oops. Give another minute or so here. So, how, how are things going for you, Conch? How, how do I say your name? Or what should I uh, call Conch it? Is, yeah, Conch is actually perfect. It's Conchina. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Conchina. Um, <laughs> things are not too bad. Just trying to keep working, keep studying, and wait for things to go back to normal. Oh, oh give me one second. Sorry. Hey, Google, stop. Yep, you're fine. That was my alarm to sign in. It's clearly a little bit late. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, but yeah, um, I noticed that. Uh, so I I reviewed the link that you sent me, and I just um, went over the video, and I saw there were a couple people preparing for CSCS on your last meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's kind of cool because I'm currently studying. As soon as like the center is open up again, I, I want to give my exam. Nice. They, uh, did they? I know they're online now, but they do them. You still have to be at a specific testing center to take it, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. You have to be at a Pearson View Center 
to take the exam. Mm -hmm. I had a funny, well, for like kind of a funny story on mine. For one, I took it, when I took it, you know, it was the old days and you still had Scantrons. And, mm -hmm. but we had, I came up and took it. It was in some WVU building. I can't remember which one now, but what's funny is about two years later, the person who gave the exam turned out to be my first, um, like direct supervisor <laughs> at oh wow at work it was yeah it was funny because my the, my first boss my first director of strength and conditioning at WVU was a guy named Mike Barwis who was there from pretty much when the program really started turning around from about 2002 to 2008 and he's got his own things now but yeah one of his former coaches they're actually married now but she's the one that gave the exam. I just remember that. And, and then by the time I came two years later, when I ended up on, on that staff, she was the second in command for, I can't remember what it was actually called like associate director or whatever it is. So I was like, Oh, wait a minute. I was like, you look, from, I think you gave me your t my test. Damn. That's pretty cool. That's a cool story right there. Yeah. It is funny how those things keep coming around. <laughs> Um, okay, but yes, yeah, so I don't know, like, uh, I think, I would think Calvin and Paul, like the two guys from the gym will join at some point. I don't know anybody else, anybody else. I may ruin it by posting it. Now they might be waiting for that. Who knows? We'll see. I'll, we'll keep playing around with this. But, um, well, especially since only two of you, so, Conch, so Jordan is, she is actually finishing up her freshman year in college. Um, she is... Yeah, uh, she's actually like the longest stand. I call her the longest standing continuous BPT trainee because she started going into freshman year in high school. <laughs> um, oh wow! Okay. And her goal is to have eventually have her own PT clinic slash BPT. Um, How old that? Whereas Jordan, on your end, uh, Conchier is basically getting started in her strength and conditioning career, and. Yeah, give us a quick, like, 30 seconds, 60 second there about what it is you're hoping to do next, Con. Sure. Um, well, Jordan, it's lovely to meet you. Um, great to connect with another uh, female professional in the field. We're definitely a rarity, and I hope that's no longer going to be the case in about 10 years. What I do, like Jerry said, um, I'm a strength and conditioning coach. I actually coach for four and a half years back home in India. And um, I quit my job to come to grad school. I just felt like I was a point. Well, I was at a point where I wanted to uh, invest in formal education. See where that took me. So I'm going to be graduating uh, in about a month, and I am excited to go back to full time coaching. That's great. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize you'd been coaching for four and a half years back home before it started. I knew you did some, but I didn't realize it was that long. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was a bit, it was a bit, um, but yeah, that's okay. I think when you and I met, it was a while ago, so that's totally fine. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, um, okay, so cool, a little more personal on this one. Um, but so what I wanted to do so today was specifically – I just wanted to talk the entire time on what I call the power spectrum. It's also, oh, whoa, there we go. So Don, um, we also got the, Don is also a, he's a strength and conditioning coach slash athletic trainer. Um, but we're literally just getting started, Don. Cool, perfect. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, so what I want to talk about today is exclusively I said, the power spectrum. It's also called some the, speed strength spectrum or the absolute speed absolute strength spectrum um it has a few names i really couldn't even tell you where i first came across it or the idea one of the ones that i have I found, found again it. Like, i haven't found it in like it like you teaching it is one of the only resources i've used for it i haven't found it in any other place yeah. the, i was about to say like the only person that can actually see it come across again is Eric Cressy and Cressy is the man. Um, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's, 
funny as hell that without even realizing it, he may have been one of the first places I heard this before going deep into it. I do think it comes a lot to Anatoly Bondarchuk stuff too, though. It goes right a lot, even if he never used the phrases, it goes a lot with um, with Bondarchuk's style of teachings from the 70s and the 80s. Um, so if you ever happen to read his things on transferring of training, a lot of it will make sense once you start like looking at it through this lens. Um, but anyway, so what we're looking at is the idea that all of physical movement, or as we're looking at it in terms of training, what, whether in a weight room or on like a competition field, it's all along the same spectrum of like everything can be put in one spectrum. Um, now we're actually going to see here in a little bit is that there's more than one of them, but they all kind of create a three-dimensional model of what that athlete needs, what that sport needs. And then within the model, you can find out if your training is actually, like if it's beneficial to, is it basically like, does it hit multiple points of the model? Is it completely outside the model, et cetera. So again, the, the, the main one though, is that speed strength model. So to recap it, what we're looking at is like, all movement is gonna ha is gonna be is gonna have force. It's gonna have speed, and you know it's gonna have different combinations all the way from almost pure speed with very little force all the way on the other end to maximal or even above maximal force production with no speed consideration at all. So on the one end of you have just the absolute speed. Again, we're actually going to talk about this in relation to maxes as well. I said, if I can ever first off get my own Zoom to not just freeze on my face and be then someday, <laughs> like, uh, I'll probably actually, I was actually thinking I'm going to send you guys out some of this information if that's on the registration email, which I think it is afterwards. So write down anything you find interesting, but I'm going to try to get some of that as is after this. But so all the way on that one end, we have absolute speed. Again, maximum velocity with almost no force that we can really measure or that matters. And when you see that, like what's, um, what are some examples you guys might be able to think of off the top of your head in sports or in physical activity that would qualify as being nearly absolute speed and very little force? What do you like, like, uh, absolute speed and very little force? Yeah. I don't think of net force necessarily in what's actually coming off of, say, the grid, but very little force in terms of creating the movement and all the rest of speed. Well, I mean, um, I guess, like, track and feel, like, spinning could uh, be categorized as high speed, even though, obviously, we know that sprinters – produce immense amounts of vertical force in order to propel themselves, but their performance is based more on the speed end of the spectrum, right? Yep, yep, very, yep, very good point. And actually using track and field, if we're gonna use track and field, probably the best, uh, I, I love track and field for strength and conditioning. There's a reason that strength and conditioning was, was basically born out of track and field. And it's because it's basically, if you think about track and field, is basically the sport of strength conditioning without weights. <laughs> um, except, except, you know, it's, it's a bunch of sports put together. And, you know, it's like, let's measure how fast you run. Let's measure how high you can explode off the ground. Um, and in track and field, the one that most exemplifies pure speed is going to be your pole vault. Or not, sorry, not, not, not what I meant. Uh, that one is, but javelin is what I saw. In my, that's what I meant to say. Javelin. Because <laughs> it's very rotational. And so, so much of it is just in how much speed can you develop from that crazy pre-stretch that they reach back from. And then, you know, how much of that circumference do they go through before actually releasing the javelin? Um, so throwing sports probably more than anything else exemplify pure speed. 
Uh, baseball is probably the top example off just the top of like in, in the public eye, you know, just uh, the pitcher, you know, the pitcher or, or the hitter, either one, but particularly the pitcher. Um, and so like that exit, like when you look at the actual velocities and again, like the what's actually happening with the, with the elbow, with the shoulder, with the ball coming out of their hand, it's an incredible amount of speed in such a short movement. Um, like I remember, I always remember seeing where, like, uh, with Randy Johnson being one of my favorite pitchers. I mean, he retired a few years ago, but that the if they were to take, like, they they measured, you know, like just like the torque on his elbow, and if they were to take that instantaneous torque right before he was about to throw a fastball, then it came to something ridiculous, like 150,000 full circles in a second or something like, that. <laughs> like just the amount of pure torque um, was crazy. But what the other thing that makes it like that is the fact that that baseball only weighs about three or five ounces, whatever, however much it is. So that is going to be one of the key determinants in how much you're looking at speed. And this actually conscious where what you said, like about track makes a very good point is that, so it's not always about whether or not there's resistance or like actual power. I said like your most explosive athletes will have a lot of power when they're sprinting, when they're sprinting on the ground or when they're jumping on the ground. But so a speed also comes in terms of any tool that you're using in that sport. Does it have any specific resistance and will it change or will it always be the same? So, like I said, in baseball, that baseball is always going to weigh the same. Um, or, you know, baseball bat takes a little bit more strength and force, but, but it's also always going to weigh the, weigh the same. You know, it's going to be in the 30-some ounce range. And then from there, it's how much speed can you generate with that same unchanging, very small resistance. Um, so we're looking at absolute speed. So we're normally looking at, in terms of an all-out uh, force intensity of only 0 to 10%. So, like, it doesn't take almost any percentage of maximum strength to throw a baseball or necessarily to throw a javelin or to kick a soccer ball. Uh, it doesn't necessarily take, you know, a whole lot of strength to make those things happen but then the strength actually helps it multiply. And then the speed is where you get a lot more of the, the power that comes out of it. And then same thing with sprinting. There's no external resistance. So you're creating a lot of power. It's mostly the speed basis. And then that's multiplied by the strength you're able to, to come up with as well. Um, so after absolute speed, we have what they, well, so speed in general, the speed realm is considered zero to 30 percent of your one rep max said like uh these are all so th these are these overlap all the time uh, but zero to 30 percent is generally considered too little intensity to work on too many things other than speed um 10 percent and under though is that like true max speed again where their external resistance is so low that that it's in essence at that point almost pure speed what that also means is that generally when you're looking at actual maximal velocity, a well-trained athlete can hit roughly the same velocity with 10% max resistance as they can with 0%. So the addition of that first 10% of what they can maximally handle doesn't actually negatively change their velocity at all because um, it's so small. After 10%, their velocity starts to drop a little bit, but it's still by far – the primary um, characteristic. Does that make sense? So for example, so how you can take that to running, if you're looking at so the, the, the pure speed and running, because that is the one thing most athletes will have in common when it comes to this, let's say, say it's all relative to what you're doing, you know, especially when it comes to running, you have friction involved. But let's say that whatever surface you happen to be training athletes in, let's say that an athlete can pretty much tend to run with a sled behind them of, I don't know, 200 pounds. <laughs> I said, I'm just, 
this is just an example. But let's say that – I'm not saying – like, I've never known anybody that actually tried max sled running. <laughs> but let's say that, like, as, as a concept, that they can run pulling a sled of about 200 pounds of extra body weight on that surface. Then – so taking so taking that, they can pretty much tell you that that athlete can probably run with maximum speed on that surface, carry anything from being – just their body weight up to pulling about 20 pounds. So about 20 pounds. So, so 10% or less of that athlete's maximum can still act. They can still generate approximately the same velocity. Um, after that, it starts to slow them down a little bit. Um, right from that though, I said third up to 30% is when you're still working on that general speed. And this right here is actually one of the bigger mistakes that coaches tend to do coaches and strength coaches just kind of lump them all together is whenever they do what they're thinking of as speed work is a lot of coaches tend to overload it. Um, if it has it either by, if they're using something like sleds, they'll, they'll, they'll fall into that trap of making, of, you know, looking for, what looks hard and what looks taxing rather than necessarily what is actually allowing the athlete to still move quickly. So when it comes to using sleds in speed work, a lot of coaches will go heavier than they should. Uh, so it's making the conscious effort to keep that on the speed side, if that's truly what you're training. And another way you see this that does not use external resistance is with um, uphill running like uphill sprinting is a great way to work on speed and power like there is more muscular force in that so that's a little more power but most of your speed work when it comes to sprinting up a hill most of your speed benefits are going to happen around seven percent incline or less i said anything anything above that level tends to start slowing the movement down enough or even changing the mechanics of the run enough to where you're no longer working pure speed. So it's the same idea though. They'll think we're going to work speed. This hills are good for speed. They're also hard. Let's go use some really some steep hills and do that. So it can be good for power production. I said, you're going to be, it's not going to be like true speed work at that point. Um, that was a tangent on speed and power, but does that make sense? Everybody else is muted. <laughs> Sorry, I just muted because that gives you better audio quality, but we're totally following so far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just thought um, I'd chime in. <laughs> let's go. Um, okay, so after that, we have what's called speed strength. So, again, the, the five are absolute speed, speed strength, power, or peak power strength speed and then absolute strength again it can be it can be annoying to remember but just always remember that when it comes to those two in the middle the speed strength and strength speed that the dominant quality is listed first um, so again speed strength comes next very high velocity with some amount of force to it this is generally considered 30 to 50 or 30 to 60 percent of maximum force capacity for an athlete so since so here we're looking at very high velocity movement still but we're looking at doing it with while also improving some force especially the ability to move that force very quickly when we're looking at actual athletics this right here speed strength is where most athletes are actually participating um, for example almost every athlete that's running and playing a game so like soccer field hockey lacrosse basketball um or even your guys who spend more time running say on a football field they're functioning most of their sport in speed strength because it because um kind of like you were saying earlier conch you do need you do want to have that higher amount of strength output to help you run faster especially if there's changes in direction again change in direction involves a little bit more burst of power than just building up speed straight ahead um, so anything that involves decelerating reaccelerating 
braking, changing direction, all those things are always going to involve a little bit more force output uh, in order to make those things happen. So all, almost all of those happen here in the range of speed strength or the ability to be running and still create a powerful motion, such as kicking a soccer ball or running and then jumping for, you know, jumping for a dunk or jumping for a header or to catch the football, whatever it is. So anytime you involve those changes in direction, changes in speeds, or you're adding extra motions, then in those cases, you're in, you know, utilizing more force and that puts you more speed strength. And again, 30 to 50 or 30 to 60% of the of one rep max or max force is, is your sweet spot for that. So what that means from the training aspect is for a lot of these athletes, when so you know, we, we work on their, on their speed by get, in the off season developmentally by increasing their peak power, incre again, cre uh, increases in strength, improve everything provided that we are training everything else. So the, um, the peak power, their strength will go up and providing them constant opportunities to achieve and improve their maximum speed but then right when they're getting around to their season or in season itself, we want to keep this sharp. So this is where the inclusion of either different explosive drills, plyometrics that will only have about 30 to 60% of max force output or lighter Olympic movements might work as well. Um, for those using powerlifting style movements, this is where accommodating resistance typically comes in like Louis Simmons with West side is almost always talking about work in the 30 to 60% range for speed. Um, you know, he's talking about it almost exclusively with barbell work, but again, like it, he gets it directly from these numbers from, from the old, old, like initial research that's just been proven and supported basically through that. Um, after the 30 to 60%, that's when we're getting to about peak power and peak power is less of a range, more of that number. It's just that, best combination of speed and force for different athletes because some athletes are more speed driven and some are more strength driven they'll all have peak power like in different parts generally speaking the bigger the athlete then their peak power will actually be on the on the little bit higher end of the spectrum because uh, they just again they can't generate speed at the same level as like most of their smaller counterparts so they tend to have peak power actually at higher percentages. So typically peak power is located between 60 to 70%, maybe up to 75% for like your biggest heavyweight style athletes of their one rep max or one rep force capacity. So if you have a sport or athletes where the sport itself has different sizes, you know, like on purpose, <laughs> like uh like wrestling classes for example this is something we would do back when back when i had a like uh was wrestling at wvu is you know we would have different like power percentages depending on whether it was the guys and say the first half the bottom weight classes or the guys in the top half of the weight classes um so the power percentages for the for the bigger guys whenever we were working on on power work would almost always be five or ten percent higher than, pot, than the same nearly identical progression for the lighter weight wrestlers. And we actually used to do the same thing in the Rich Rodriguez era of football as well. We did that with like linemen and skill guys, for example. The linemen's peak power work would, might, it would be slightly lower volume, but their peak power work might go all the way to 80, even 85% in some cases, whereas most of the skill guys were between the um, 65 and 75 percent uh again just because the difference between a 195 pound explosive athlete and a 310 pound explosive athlete can be enormous just based on that force and, and, and the mass that they have even if they're both explosive as hell <laughs> it's like the their ability to reach that their max speed in whatever amount of time you're looking at can influence whether it's better to go on the lighter side or the heavier side of peak power for that athlete. Again, so 60 to 70% is general, but so that can go up to 75, even 80 for some bigger athletes. Um, 
That leads us into strength speed. Again, higher amounts of strength with some velocity, but not a ton. I personally consider this a tight, like the uh, when looking at sports, what the analogy that always helps me out here is I consider this like the type of power that where you're overcoming something. So it's not just simply about moving and moving quick or moving strongly, but actually having to, to provide that speed, but overcome another force or another resistance. Um, like your best example of strength, speed and sports is going to be again, like your bigger wrestlers and well, again, your linemen, like, you know, when you're actually having to exert your force against another person, and actually try to move them off, like the speed helps and you're trying to overcome them with that. But most of your energy is, is spent on actually just trying to overcome the, like the resistance that that other person's providing. Um, you do have it in non-person to person sports, although it's generally not as, not as high on the strength, on the strength part of the spectrum. Um, like going back to track and field again, your best example here would be shot put you know, they have the highest resistance of any track and field athlete that they're dealing with, even though like, um, I actually can never remember shot weights because they're, di they're different in every single class, <laughs> too many age groups, but you know, like the, um, the top men's weights are what 12, maybe 16 pounds. Like, yeah, there's just too many different levels between female weights, male weights, middle school, high school, college, pro, or <laughs> it's, I could never really just which. Um, but so that's the, that's the best uh, example using a, at least that I can think of coming off of a non person to person um, sport activity. So you can kind of like sit, see where that's coming from. Another example of speed of strength speed. I mean, that may not be as obvious is the athlete who has to generate, it might be just their body weight, they have to, but they have to generate that speed, like their whatever explosive power they have coming off of a dead stop. Um, especially if they're, if that dead, if that movement doesn't even have the chance to be in a, um, in a mechanically advantageous position. So for example, like a, well, like a sprinter, like take the fastest ones, like hundred meter sprinters that very first step is going to be mostly strength speed. So, so what you say it's crucial for like developing, changing direction and stuff like that? Right. Especially beginning, like, like strength speed is your like rate of force development. Uh, but like I said like all these things overlap. So rate of force development is how quickly you can develop force anywhere on the spectrum. So from zero to 100%, rate, the rate of force development is there. But to me, the idea, like I always liked thinking of rate of force development as a car going from zero to 60. And to me, that idea of going from a dead stop is most exemplified by strength speed. Um, is, yeah, so like I say, so even in that sprinter coming off of blocks, so it's like power is what they're going for, but the majority of that power generated from that very first movement when they don't even have any speed, they're creating all their speed from scratch is strength speed. Because the more strength that they can drive through that, like through that ground and through the blocks for those first steps, that's gonna determine how much power they actually generate to come out of it. And that's gonna help them continue to then use the stretch reflex of every single step hitting the floor and being able to drive into a faster and faster stride. Um, so, so athletes, another one is, well, this one's like for specifically for Jordan. <laughs> um, again, athletes who you're not moving. <laughs> so if you are a goalie, for example, and you know, things are coming, you're, you know, like things are crazy. You might be taking a step here and there, but if you're waiting for that reaction, strength speed has a very big component in making that crucial move, maybe from like defending one side of the post to suddenly having to, to be able to jump up and, you know, drive across to try to protect the other crossbar or something. Um, so, so, so strength speed has, shows up in, all, in almost every, so let me start that over. Strength speed is not the priority in very many sports, 
but it shows up in almost every sport as the very first initial movement that they make. Um, so, so especially in like generating that very first step speed in almost any run, any change in direction, um, and then which then allows you to create more power and more speed like through the rest of the movement. Um, so strength speed is generally built from that 70 to 85% range. So I said there's overlaps. You can see like the bottom of that comes right into a lot of the power range as well. As a 70 to 85 is generally where we're looking at that. So, and a lot of times you can target it even more directly with ways to specifically work on developing more force even higher. Um, like personally, this is where I use a lot of, uh, a lot of pause very like you know this is where my pause squats pause bench pause pressing a lot of pause movements come in is to eliminate stretch reflex to make the very first part a little bit more specific on pure strength uh then 85 percent and up is where we get to absolute strength you get one spectrum so the faster you're trying to create you know let's just use a one rep max so the faster you're trying to create a one rep max effort the more force you generate, but you don't actually you can see the velocity very much. It's it's all it's force, 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 force. I say so this will go from 85 and up. Again, remember that when it comes to training, I mean, and in sports to some degree, but it doesn't just stop at 100 percent. It'll actually go up as high as 120 to 140 percent for athletes. Again, so and that's where your eccentrics come in. And so the ability to resist, to, the, to provide force and just try to fight it off or resist it is always higher than your ability to actually overcome it. And, so, and, and that's like the, um, uh, I was trying to get the right word. Um, so that's kind of how I always looked at concentric versus eccentric. You know, concentric, your muscle shortening, that's what most people consider, quote unquote, the rep. But you're in essence overcoming the resistance with a, with a concentric motion. You're creating the movement by overcoming it. With your negatives, with your eccentrics, you're resisting it as it lengthens your muscles out, as it stretches you out. You can said you can resist it much longer and with much more force than you can ever overcome it. Like think of it as a tree falling on you. If it's light enough or you're strong enough, you can push that tree off of you. You overcame it. But if it gets heavy enough at some point, you can no longer actually push the tree off of you and you need to just do your best to resist it as long as possible. They said you can always resist it and create more force. And that's where your over 100% comes in. And said in those higher levels of force, typically between 120 to 140% of max capacity for athletes, it, that is shaped like a bell curve. So for those of you actually looking at using heavy eccentrics, heavy negatives in training or with athletes at some point, whether it's to just overload their system and, and expose them to higher levels of force through a range of motion, or if it's on the flip side to just start preparing their tendons and their ligaments for higher levels of force, remember it's going to be in the bell curve. You're... So your newest, least developed athletes are going to have a max force capacity that's, the clo that's pretty close between eccentric and concentric. And that's because they're just not going to know how to actually handle higher levels of force. So whatever their max capacity is in a normal rep is going to be pretty close to what they can handle even resisting it because they just they haven't been trained to resist yet. Um, you see this a lot said so with less developed athletes in the weight room. Think of the athlete, for example, who <coughs> let's just use a really easy, like, let's say it's a new trainee and they bench a hundred pounds and it's pretty close to max, you know, then you put one Oh five on and may, maybe one ten, And not only do they, do they not press it up, but they can't even resist it on the way down. You know, I think everybody here has probably seen that athlete. They go from being able to, to grind it out to literally just one step higher. It's not that they just can't get it, but they literally get buried by it. Like it's crushed. Like they can't resist it at all. Um, 
So that's the beginning of the bell curve of eccentric strength. So that athlete needs when, – once that athlete gets exposed to higher levels of force and resistance, they'll start learning how to actually turn on the, like, that forceful resistance, that forceful lengthening of the muscles. That will lead most athletes to the higher parts of the bell curve, which I said, like, these are the ones who usually at most can, can, uh, can create up to 40% higher levels of force with a max eccentric than others. So generally, so this is, this is most trainees or most athletes. So imagine athlete that can, you know, bench 300 pounds, but they, they can at least control another 90, 100 pounds on the way down for a really heavy eccentric. Um, so, so the body has a much higher capacity that higher for like eccentric force on the, on the other end, once you get these athletes who are very highly trained and are starting to get pretty close to whatever, whatever just their body's most capable of, they're going to, their concentric ability. So their ability to actually create that force is going to start approaching the, what their maximal eccentric or resistance force is. So they'll actually close that gap of percentage again. Um, and so your best athletes, like let's say, well, Ray Williams, cause he's been in here before, <laughs> um, you know, Ray Williams max squat is, he did either 1,063 or 1,081 <laughs> on the, his last time he set a new PR. And, you know, his – I said, well, without – I'm actually going to – I'm going to make a note and I'm going to text him and ask him this question <laughs> just out of curiosity. Uh, if he, Like, if he ever he does negatives and if he has, what was it? Because chances are, like, I would be willing to bet that said he's so close to generating the most amount of force possible from his body that even a 10% increase would probably be very hard for him to handle eccentrically. It's like he's probably so close to that. Um, that and said, that's a type of, of strength threshold. Uh, like, it's actually – it's not a new idea – it's um, – has anybody here ever heard, ever read Super Training or know what it is? Like, I mean, we've gone into it a little bit as a staff, so I know, I know Calvin's at least read part of it. But uh, – or Mel Sif is the author of Super Training. It's one of the most boring yet deepest books in strength and conditioning. It's, it's ridiculously in-depth. <laughs> But congrats to anybody who actually makes it from page one to page last. <laughs> uh, have you ever seen that one, Don, or you can't or actually looked into it? Yeah, um, I've I've heard of I've I've heard of some of the concepts that Stiff discusses. I am not. I haven't read the whole thing now. <laughs> uh, I'll say like it, it's it, it's uh, uh, yeah it, it's one of those where you have to make a purposeful effort <laughs> to decide to study it. Um, it's written like an encyclopedia. What is he talking about, like prolonged overload and stuff like that? Are you talking about that guy? Um, he does go into that. Yeah, he does go into a set. Like, it's actually fairly early in the book. I just can't can't think of the actual the actual term of that difference between so like what what your body's capable of eccentrically versus what it's capable of concentrically. That's super maximal strength, but. It's because it's actually it's it's along the same idea as competitive strength versus training strength, like because um, he was also one of the first places where I've ever seen one of the first strength coaches I ever saw the idea of actually quantifying how most athletes will have a competitive max and a training max that are not the same. You know, said so that one's more hormonally and more neural. You know, since most athletes get more excited when they're when they're actually in that competition they can literally create more force because their nervous system is more primed and they have better horm and they have a better like adrenal hormone environment to create more force and more power so it's you know it, it basically gives like competing or especially peaking that ex that last extra push other than just the recovery or competitive itself um but 
So that's how also if you know if somebody's hitting maxes in the gym that they can't hit in competition, then, I mean, they're really screwing something up. Because <laughs> um, it should be the other way around for sure. But so anyway, so we have zero up to 140% at your disposal here. And so to kind of recap them each briefly, absolute speed is – you know, things like body weight sprinting or very low external resistance, maximum speed movements. Almost all of your rotational sports are going to be at absolute speed. Um, then you have speed strength. So again, most of your sports involving like running, changing direction, body weight, explosive movements, and then using a ball, like, you know, using, I mean, just a tool like a ball. Peak power is going to be your most explosive sports. And, um, then you're going to have strength, speed. So your athletes and sports who have to really overcome mm. fairly high external resistances. And then your pure strength, which isn't really around in most sports other than help like um, max effort lifting. But said so the higher that strength capacity is, the relation, like it, as long as it's not taking away from anything else, then the better everything else is going to be. And so one of my key components is always that an athlete can't be too strong. They can just spend too much time working on being stronger. Um, so, so like, so one of my pet peeves that I mentioned in the first class is just that I hate when coaches say blah, 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 too strong. <laughs> like I said, like, cause it doesn't work that way. Unless you're rifle, you might be too strong for a rifle. You probably have to be even more aware of how softly you're squeezing that trigger. So, okay. Um, anything on that? Because so we have actually multiple spectrums, and that's where I want to go over this the next part. <laughs> uh, well, actually, uh, actually, I did forget. Like, um, so I mentioned this last time too. Remember that different sports or different um, can actually have different positions in this. In this, so for example, a well, soccer, most – you're going to have 10 people on the field who are in, or on each team who are speed strength because they are running, they're changing direction, they're being explosive, they're, you know, kicking a relatively small res, uh, resistance. And then you're going to have that one player on each team who is more power, and that's the goalkeeper because, again, they're going to have to – they're going to be moving around, but they have to generate maximum force – it like in an instant to cover the most the most um, distance possible, and then they basically get the rest again. <laughs> um, I actually was laughing at Jordan a couple of weeks ago because her sister, who is also a soccer player but a field player, was saying that she takes a really long time between rest periods or in rest periods. I was like, that's literally your sport is being explosive and sitting around and waiting. <laughs> so, um, or football is another one. You know, so it's like your your quarterback, your kicker are going to be the most bottom of, of speed strength. Then you're going to have like your receivers are going to be next, a little bit higher up on the chain, slightly higher up on the chain. You're going to have like your defensive backs and your outside perimeter defensive players. Then anywhere from speed strength through power, you're going to have most of your running backs, depending on whether they're more of a shifty change of direction, Tavon Austin type or more of a, like, run straight through everybody, you know, William Refrigerator Perry. <laughs> um, and then your linemen are going to be the ones up on, like, strength, speed. So, again, even across a sport, you can have this across. Um, you know, other sports that we have big differences are rugby. You know, you're going to have a lot of, like, rugby is going to be pretty similar to to football in the case of the positions. Hockey is going to be relatively similar in terms of the where you're going to have people on each one, but football probably has the ones that are most most um, different than all of them. Okay, so the next part is and so like that was one of the three dimensions. Dimension number two is the energy system. So what we were looking at so far was purely neuromuscular. Purely nervous system, muscles, what can you do for me in terms of speed and force and go? 
So number two is looking at the energy system. So they always teach this in, you know, in school and classes and courses, they always just teach energy systems in relation to the time that it takes to get there. So that means you always go through ATP phosphocreatine first. It's always the one that they, you know, because that's your number one energy system during all high intensity activities. And somebody help me out so I can take a break and drink some coffee real quick. And when, uh, what's the time frame for ATP CP? That's not going to be zero to 30 seconds. Woo yep. Um, up to 30 seconds, the ATP CP will, that will be by itself. It'll be about 10. I mean, like it's like meaning like where it's almost the only source and then it's very high for up to 30. Yes. Okay. Um, and and I got some of those little details that they very rarely go over is the ATP phosphocreatine system does go through a um, what's the, what's the word here I'm looking for. It's not the same beginning to end, like it uh, it degrades. Yeah, there we go. Like it will actually degrade and has a couple of steps downward. Like the first six seconds are gonna be your highest quality ATP that your body's breaking down. So those first six seconds are when you get your absolute maximum peak power or in those first six seconds. From six to 10, you then get, Again, it's, it's just a slight leveling downward because you're, you're breaking down slightly lower quality um, ADP and AMP as opposed to ATP. If, sorry, Jordan, because I know <laughs> it's like, she's the, the one that I know has zero education in like specifically ATP, ADP, all that stuff. But looking at the, the three main fuel types there, breaking energy down, ATP, has three phosphagen ions, a DP diphosphate has two, and a MP monophosphate has one. And each one basically is like a slightly lower quality um, fuel substrate as it breaks down. So whenever we're coming out of rest, we get to have almost all, tri almost all triphosphates. Once we hit six seconds, we start relying on more dye and monophosphates to replenish the triphosphates. Um, so it's a, it's a slight decrease in power output as the fuel source drops down. Then, um, then it goes from ATP you know, to or into fast glycolysis. Again, these all overlap, just like everything else. Fast glycolysis is when we start looking mostly at breaking down carbohydrates, but it's not very efficient yet. So we're still creating like waste products um, with hydrogen ions. So we're basically still looking at getting energy as fast as possible and not particularly efficiently. And then, you know, they go through slow glycolysis and then it runs into the aerobic system. And again, slow glycolysis and the aerobic system are oxidative. You have oxygen and it can last forever. Um, almost, but actually, I, I, I'm, I'm out of touch in here. What did they, uh, cause I think they've changed this. How do they, do they teach this as three or four energy systems now? It's changed literally three or four times since I've been studying. Well, like you mean slow and fast glycolysis? Y yeah. Like whenever, like if, like for example, somebody taking a test or somebody going through a textbook or a class right now. Do they say there are three or four energy systems? They, they just, they go back and forth all the time. Like, do they consider glycolysis one energy system again, or is it back to two? Yeah, yeah I'm trying to think. I know we, we like distinctly learned two. Um, I forget if they're calling it four though altogether. Yeah. Uh, it's just, one of these yeah. things that doesn't matter unless you're yeah. taking a test. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cause I know I can, <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Now, um, I was just going to say, like, in, in, for the CSCS, at least, I know that it's three energy systems, but the big focus now is on the energy systems are not exclusive off each other. It's right. just which one is, you know, dominant in exactly. whatever time. 
Yeah, they say like the end of phosphagen is the start of fast glycolysis, which is about 20 to 30. So that's where it's at right now. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it's crazy because they literally do change all that. Like they, they change every once in a while. But I mean, I'm, I'm glad it makes me really happy. As somebody who's not, you know, like reading textbooks as often these days, it makes me really happy to hear that they're talking more about which one's dominant now because that is the key idea. Except they're all going all the time. And that's why both of these are spectrums, just like the speed strength spectrum is one spectrum because you always have some velocity and you always have some strength. So having better of both always helps. Same idea with the energy systems. Like they're both always going. And so that makes me really happy to hear about that they're focusing more on just which one's dominant. Um, Cause like, I love extremes. I am a person of extremes <laughs> in several ways. <laughs> and I like, I personally hate aerobic exercise. I'm making myself run though. Cause I've, I've, I've paid for hating aerobic exercise for so long. Um, but I actually love the, I love extreme endurance athletes because they show this better than anything else. Is it energy system and like human energy is practically infinite. Once you get to the, once you get to the aerobic system, I said like, you can actually train that so high where something else will stop you or kill you. <laughs> like it won't be the energy system itself it will either be because you finally ran out of carbohydrates um and slow glycolysis just could not keep up anymore and you know can you make ketones it will be because your body just finally needed to sleep <laughs> um like i said something else will stop it otherwise it can keep going and i, I love that about ultra endurance athletes like Cliff Young is my favorite of all time. So if, if you've never ever heard the legend of, or the story of Cliff Young, then I definitely suggest you go check it out or I'll just tell you now. <laughs> but 62 year old farmer who just showed up to a massive endurance race in Australia from New Zealand in overalls and boots. <laughs> and they're like, who the hell is this guy? Why is he here? Why is he running this 600 mile race? <laughs> he's going to, he's going to die. And five days later he won because he literally never stopped running. <laughs> like, like he, it, the, and it's actually called the, the young shuffle, the cliff young shuffle. And it's what most ultra endurance athletes use now. Cause it is a very, very, very low energy cyclically efficient form of move. It's basically like falling forward. It's basically what it is. Just catching yourself the whole time. Yep. But it's like, but, so he is one of my most badass athletes of all time. Um, so, okay. So, you know, so, so most of the time, anyway, that's what we were talking about that is they teach it to you in that it starts here, ATP, phosphocreatine, glyco glycolytic system, first fast, then slow, then oxidative system. They're all always working. It's just which one's giving you the most energy right now. That's how it's typically taught. And in terms of being able to then, you know, like, which is important, that is important because you need to be able to look at different sports and athletes and say, it, it, it comes down to being this easy, but very few people, coaches make it this easy. Like how long is this, how long does the athlete actually do their sport activity per action. Most of the time, it's a split second or seconds. Most of the time, then okay. So that lets you see. Basically, take that, look at it via the energy systems. Which one is it higher in, or you know, where does that put it? So if you have a, you know, so if you're looking at like a defender or a forward in soccer. May, probably midfield too, but they're a little bit more consistently running. But say you're looking at a typical mi uh, defender or forward in soccer, they're probably running or sprinting for less than 10 seconds almost every time they're ever on that ball. So you can look at that and be like, okay, we're definitely looking at a short burst of ATP phosphocreatine. Then you're – same thing for football. You know, it's 
the classic idea that no football play almost ever tends to last more than seven seconds. So it's so it is very directly in that spot. Then it is how often do they do it, both in terms of time. That can be that can be um, expressed as either time or in terms of like almost like repetitions. Like for example, in some like continuous sports, like well, mostly continuous sports, I should say, like basketball, soccer, etc. You're better at looking at this in terms of how frequently they do it um, as time. Like for example, in soccer, I know like the, the numbers can get obscene. Like they can look at you know, like making over a thousand short little quick bursts through a single game per player. Um, so it's more along the lines of how long do they typically do it before they come out or how many times. But then you have something like football where at most a player is generally going to be in three to four plays at a time or an entire possession at most is usually eight to 11 possessions at a time. So you can also you look at it that way. And then also, so basically that's giving you the intensity of an activity which is like the length of it. It's giving you the repetitions of the activity. Then if there's bigger breaks, it's in essence giving you sets of the sport. And the time frame between that or like is in essence giving you a rest period. So you can literally break down a sport and get at least an idea of what they had to do if it wasn't in the sport itself. Um, that's not saying that's what the athletes should necessarily do. We're just trying to reverse engineer it to get the information of what it looks like. So to use American football as the, as the example, it's a start stop sport. So every play is going to be generally seven seconds or less. So your actual burst of intensity are very high intensity, seven seconds or less. You're generally going to have rest periods of about 30 to 40 seconds before having to do it again. Most players are going to have three to five plays at a time that they do it. Like your best players are going to be three to five plays in a row before they get subbed out um, for a couple plays. So, and then at most, they're generally going to be involved for, you know, so like eight to 11 plays at a time before they come out. So that gave us the intensity, seven seconds or less. That gave us the rest periods between the reps, 30 to 40 seconds at most. That gave us the number of repetitions, anywhere from three to 11, if we want to do it in the short little before they get a break or not, or the full set. And then longer rest periods if we want to have multiple, multiple sessions of the same sets and reps. Like, you know, so that, I don't know the statistic, but, you know, they may have, let's say you're training, like looking at a half, they may have, you know, six, seven possessions and a half. So you can literally take all those numbers, pull them out of the sport, look at them as pure data in terms of effort, recovery, repetition, and longer breaks, and then see what it is you need to train. Um, so most sports, so probably where the problem that, um, the reason I think this is so important, one of them, is most coaches, I mean, tend to look at this as one straight line because that's how it's taught. So they look at it as very short sprint work, a.k.a. are like purely anaerobic work. Then they look at it as longer or high rep or low rest sprint work when we start looking at like lactic acid as a big component or, you know, basically our um, fast glycolysis waste period um or anaerobic system waste period and then they look at it as aerobic as your aerobic system and cardio thing is the sports do not actually react like said the uh, one activity one effort reacts like this none of the others do this actually works better if you connect your different energy systems and remove what is not necessary most sports are, are anaerobic and what they call a lactic, meaning that their efforts are finished before they build up like waste products and lactic acid. So you get anaerobic, AKA short without oxygen, 
a lactic without lactic acid or waste product buildup. So they're very short. And then they're also aerobic, AKA oxidative from their recovery standpoint. Because once you stop and you get a chance to breathe, guess what's actually helping you recover and get back to normal? That aerobic oxidative system. So you have two ends of the spectrum. Generally, one of them is where most sports are at, the lactic anaerobic, and then being recovered by the aerobic. And most sports are no, well, so not, I don't want to keep saying most. A lot of sports are never actually cross into that middle of, of like high waste product, lactic acid issues. But think of all the coaches that think that's where they need to train to make it their athletes in better shape <laughs> is right in that middle. And not to mention that middle ground is also happens to be the hardest one to recover from because of all the waste products and breakdown it creates, you know, literally creating that like acidic environment for hours up to even a couple of days afterwards. Um, so figuring out where in your sport you're on, you're on this, like, like, let's take a look at that. The, sports that are actually in that middle ground there aren't many um so i mean you can reach there in continuous sports like soccer and basketball and field hockey and lacrosse you can although it's not very common especially in sports like um that are across an entire field because there's almost always periods of stopping jogging walking even standing while you wait for the ball to come next to you. So it's possible, but highly unlikely in sports like soccer, lacrosse, field hockey, et cetera. Basketball, because it's a little closer knit, you, the game can't get too far away from you at any one point in time. It is a little bit more common in basketball, um, especially if you have, you know, somebody's like not making baskets, so that it keeps going back and forth. <laughs> um, so the closer together your sport is, the more common it is. Actually, as a result of that, it is more common to have a little bit of lactic, of like a little bit of this energy buildup in women's soccer than men's soccer, because women's soccer is a tighter game. They generally don't run quite as fast and don't kick the ball quite as far. So they end up playing against each other a higher percentage of the game than in male, than in men's soccer. Um, Probably this, like football, never sees this. <laughs> football has literally no reason to ever be working on this, like working in this middle ground of fighting through like burning energy systems, lactic acid burning, everything hurts. They never need to, but they're probably the number one biggest culprits of doing this all the time. It's like, you want to do this because it's hard? Okay, but at least admit that the reason you're doing it is only because it's hard. <laughs> it's not actually improving their athleticism at all. Um, honesty goes a long way. <laughs> the old, like probably the biggest sport that actually it, like the sport that lives here is wrestling. Wrestling is probably the one sport. Is it's very high muscular output, so you have a higher. You're, you're going to jump into waste products faster as is. Rounds are two to three minutes long. And a stop in wrestling isn't even real. <laughs> like if, uh, for those of you who've never actually like, you know, checked out the rules of wrestling, even the rest periods in between, even in between periods aren't real rest periods. Like it's not like basketball or football or soccer where there's a set amount of time between period one and period two. All they do is figure out who's going, like who's going in what position get them set and then they go ahead and start <laughs> it's like, there's no actual time rest period <laughs> so like so like so wrestling lives in this time in this uh in this sporting range um a lot of people don't know that about wrestling by the way <laughs> so again so dimension two then this energy system is, is again matching your what i call like your activity system and then your recovery system and making sure those are the two things you're actually focusing on and not just assuming that it's only one or the other or the whole thing. Um, 
one of the for those of you guys who like to look into it one one person who's a occasionally good resource he just doesn't put as much stuff out there um about matching extremes is he's another one of guys that like depending on who you're talking to is kind of a love hate factor in strength and conditioning your best coaches usually are <laughs> um there's a guy named alex viada v-i-a-d-a and where he, I said, this is literally his specialty because what he specializes in is training people who like to do com like completely opposing sports. Um, for example, powerlifting and marathons. Like that was his, that was like his first niche was powerlifters um, who also like to be good at running marathons. <laughs> so so combining like pure a lactic training with also improving the aerobic system to the maximum extreme of each. Uh, he's a, he's a good resource on that. Side note, he is very active on social media. Also side note, he's also kind of a dick. So, <laughs> so again, like feel free to look into that. Just if you feel to interact with him, just letting you know. Um, I haven't done that. I'm just, I've just, I've seen it. <laughs> So, all right. Um, any anything on that before we go in like the final dimension of this? So, like you would say, it kind of depends on the, the goal at that time because you would still you could still train in that that lactic threshold if your goal is you know to get bigger, right? Per se. But, well, yeah, that, that's actually a really good point. Yeah, because that lactic threshold is going to then signal a higher level of growth hormone release once you're once to once it all clears out. So yeah, like so it definitely has good uses um, in training. But exactly, so yeah, th so this is all like reverse engineering is basically yeah. what this comes down to is like so this is what my athlete actually needs and what they this is what my athlete actually does when they're playing their sport. So as I look at how much time I have or to get them to that point, then I want to make sure that I'm making these things better to get as I get to that point. Um, so yeah, so for example, like on the like on the first spectrum, the power spectrum, yeah, it's you know how much focus do you want to put on getting stronger, stronger, stronger versus peak power? and versus speed, seeing where they're actually at when they're in their sport. And on this spectrum, the energy system one, exactly. It's like, which is gonna be the most important, excuse me, which is gonna be the most important one when they're actually active? And then what are the physical components to help me make that better? So for like a lactic, like so anaerobic, a lactic energy systems, that's gonna be, yeah, like power, 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 speed, 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 strength helps those as well. Um, whereas when you get more lactic, that's more continued acceleration, the ability to continue to create that, um, and not peter out. And then, you know, but if it's, uh, you know, if the aerobic system is important, both either for the sport itself or for the recovery, then making sure you have that, you know, if, if it's important for the sport, then you need to be working that aerobic system pretty much year round. If it's important more so for just the recovery, then you want to have a good base and foundation of it, but not spend too much time focusing on it. Biggest culprits there, number one, by far baseball. Like I said, like base, traditional baseball coaches love their multiple mile runs for a sport that literally never ever uses that <laughs> system. <laughs> Uh, there's a reason you have amazing baseball players who are all like fat and basically moving heart attacks. You know, uh -huh. it's like uh -huh. not that they're the best they can be, but it's uh -huh. literally uh -huh. that unimportant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So this is yeah. So this is all like your targets for reverse engineering. And yeah, the further out you are, then the less specific you need to get. So anytime you have a good reason to to do another point of training, then by all means, yeah, then that's when you would actually definitely use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so even if even if like that anaerobic like lactic energy system is not actually present in your sport, what that mostly means is don't be doing that in like the weeks leading up to season. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. So would you say like this training an athlete within those spectrums, like depending on th- their sport would be something you would want to do most of the time and close to, to competition periods? Right. Like definitely it's what you want to focus on close to competition periods. Um, the further out you are, it's more breaking down what even goes into them. Some are super basic. Like I said, like aerobic system, that's basically one thing. Yeah. But when you're looking at like your anaerobic energy systems, then you're looking at a lot of like the a lot of your strength, speed, and your power. So that that's when they start crossing over. It's like so the more anaerobic the sport is, you want to make sure that basically it's like you know why the more anaerobic your sport is, that's also saying it's more important to be in the weight room year round if you can, and not just per, like before season. Hmm. you know but because like that's literally where your aerobic capacity or your anaerobic capacity excuse me comes from is how strong are you how powerful are you and how fast are you yeah so your so ability to break those different things down yeah and, and, and yeah then how much time to spend to it but yeah, the closer you are to season then anything that doesn't fall in these categories should be being removed the closer you get in season and in season Assuming you're in season training, which cough, cough, every athlete should be cough, cough. Assuming you're in season training, then basically nothing that's outside of these should be in your training program at all. <laughs> like everything should be either helping you keep your, your performance um, in the best shape possible or should be helping you recover. Like there's no reason to do something that doesn't, if it doesn't do one of those two things, if it's in season, don't do it. Um, you have no idea how many coaches I've worked for in the past who like w- would still, you know, just cause they got mad, like th- their punishment would, you know, it goes back to that old fallback of punish them. So we're just going to make them run. And then their punishment, it's like, so, okay, you're doing that, but you're also completely changing <laughs> like what this athlete's going through. And it'll be like the middle of the season, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, good, we're going to run stadium steps for three hours the day after you had a game. Cool. (laughs) Yeah. And, oh, what's that? You're putting the punishment on them, but you want the strength coach to be the one that's there at 6 a.m. and do it? Cool. Huge respect for coaches who actually do their own punishing, by the way, and don't make the strength coach do it all. Side note. Um, I'm not the bad guy. You're the bad guy. (laughs) all right, so the, the third one, the third dimension, this one is probably, uh, so this one is also like, it's an idea, it's well known, but then not many people actually use it specifically. And granted, it is the least important out of these three, but that's the way that these things work, is if, if your, your power spectrum and if your energy system spectrum, if they're both on point, then that's when number three can really make a huge difference. It'll still help at all times, but it will make the biggest difference if the other two are on point. And the biggest difference, and I said number three, is when we're looking at the actual contraction types. Um, so this isn't a spectrum per se, but it is again reverse engineering the sport based on the actual muscular contraction. So again, we've already been talking about concentric and eccentric a lot. But again, so concentric is, you know, in a weight room, it's quote unquote the rep usually. So concentric is officially when your muscles are actually shortening and creating the movement against the resistance. Um, In terms of maximum force capacity, concentric is usually considered one. So 100% of maximum force is is generally talking about concentric force. So like a one rep max is looking at concentric. Um, you have isometric, so when your muscles are not moving and they're creating a force at a standstill position, um, so they're not moving, whether it's shortening or lengthening. So this can be either because it's um, there's immovable isometrics, so that's where you can generate maximum force against an immovable object. So, like for example, uh, like pin pulls or like rack pulls, rack presses anything like that 
very hard to you like they're very effective if used appropriately um but you have to make sure that the athlete is understanding what they're doing because i can i can go set up a barbell underneath pins at you know like my mid thigh position and i can either barely generate force and in, in i can either barely push through the floor and pull up against the rack and just wait for five ten seconds or whatever or I can actually push and pull as hard as I possibly can. <laughs> so an enormous difference, and they can actually look almost the same to everybody else. So the athlete really has to understand that they're supposed to commit like full effort for those types of isometrics. Your other type of isometric, I always call your more like voluntary isometric or purposeful isometric, and that's, that, that's in essence a pause. So you're not trying, it's not that you're trying to move, it's basically a holding isometric. So you're not trying to move an immovable object, you're trying to hold a movable object. So like a pause squat, or a pause bench, or a segment snatch pull, or something like that. Like anything that involves pauses is an isometric of the purpose of the, of the holding variety, whereas your classical isometrics are more of your movable um, variety. Um, so some characteristics about isometrics is one is because they don't move, then they do actually have the least amount of muscle damage involved because the muscle is not moving in order to actually basically rip itself apart. So they have very little muscle damage. So you can actually recover from isometrics very quickly. And, um, the downside to so they're actually very effective, but that's also where the downside also comes in. They also tend to be only effective within roughly 15 degrees of their joint angle because they're not moving. So, uh, so they had their heyday in like the earlier 1900s, middle 1900s, but but I said use appropriately. They're fantastic for for targeting specific angles. Um, like I said, so I mean, you're not going to become completely strong through isometrics, in, like completely, because it's because of the angle. But they're fantastic at troubleshooting or helping you with specifics. So uh, I, uh, I use them a lot to uh, help control movements, like weak points um, in an overall movement. I'll put them in a, a similar position and then may load them in different ways and just have them stabilize. So just control that com that component of control. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, you know, when it comes to te yeah, to yeah, getting people just to, like feel and get used to movements, getting strong because that that's a, it's both a skill. Yeah, you know, movement is both a skill and um and a habit. So yeah, the, the more you can get them to get used to that feeling of where they're supposed to be, the more they can both learn it, and then the muscles themselves are in that point of remembering where to be at. Yeah, yeah, it really utilizes that sensory system for a specific uh, point in space, you know, and it, it definitely, I've, I've seen good results with it for sure. Yeah, um, like, uh, like one of my favorite, well, my favorite favorite, both personally and then with athletes, is the paw squat. Mm -hmm. I love paw squats. Mm -hmm. I love <laughs> Like them. back squats and front. Mm -hmm. um, but since you get that bottom, and so the, the, the angle is huge. It says, like, so the biggest reason to use them for something like squats or a t traditional exercise or bench is so a you're getting rid of like, there's lots of reasons. It depends on which one you have. So a you're getting rid of the stretch shortening cycle. Um, so again, you're actually allowing yourself to work more strength speed out of the bottom by not having that elastic, that stretch cycle, uh, bounce, um, Athletes can store that potential energy from movement and stretching anywhere from two all the way up to a ridiculous eight seconds, but most of them are going to be two wow. to four. Wow. Yeah, to, to, get, to get four seconds or more, you have to be really strong <laughs> it's like, to do sense. that. Um, but so a pause can help you get, I said, get rid of most of that, but it's basically the idea of staying tight in that position. You know, you don't go to the bottom of a pause squat and relax. Mm -hmm. You go there, stay ready, and then try to explode out. But you have less of that stored potential energy because it's instantaneously 
being like dissipated into the air. Mm-hmm. You know, so you go from 100% potential energy instantly degrading itself downward and dissipating. And then with, you know, after a two second count, depending on that athlete, they might have anywhere from 80% to like 20% of it left. I made those numbers of 20, 80% up. I mean, but just as like, you know, relatively like the idea of using it to that way you have to create most of that force yourself without utilizing that bounce. Um, so it does cause the biggest spike in blood pressure too. Right. Those uh, that's true. Actually, yeah, yeah. Yep. Dude, I man, I'm performance based. I almost never look at health. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's that's my niche. I, no. I did like nine months of cardiac rehab. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, that, but yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, another another one is like so the position, like um, especially if you deal with this, like uh, for example, we're big. Like here at the gym, you know, for athletes who athletes who are good at it or get used to it, you know, we're big like ass to grass squatters. I mean, not necessarily like you have to actually, you know, get down your ankles like Michaela does, Jordan's sister. <laughs> and there's a couple others who do that. But but we, we are very big proponents here of getting your hips underneath your knee joint if possible. And if that athlete is both possible and learns how to do it well. Um but when it comes to a pause, for example, it's like there's a huge difference between holding it, like use a squat. You know, there's a huge difference. But, like, choose your angle to where you're going to get the most muscular activation possible if if that's your goal is to generate that, like, force development. So using a squat, for an example, about parallel or slightly lower than parallel is going to be way harder to hold than actually going even deeper because a good, like a good squatter knows how to basically sit on their calves, <laughs> you know, like they will basically put their hamstrings on their calves and they can relax there. So they're right. still going to end up with that strength speed part. And in fact, that'll be an even bigger component because they will be almost relaxed out of it, but they won't be having like the muscular contraction that goes with it when they come out of it or as much, they'll have to generate more of it. So again, just slight differences. Mm -hmm. Like um, squatting is like the one thing I'm good at in my life (laughs) when it comes to lifting. So um, my, I have a record for this actually. My, I have a, I have a 315 pound, 57 second max pause squat record (laughs) Um, that I set a few years ago. And Mm -hmm. I know it was basically uh, what the hell, like what the hell I'm just going to do this for the hell of it at the end of my workout. And I set a little speech from the movie 13th warrior come out. It's a Viking prayer and it's exactly 57 seconds long. And I said 315. I think I'm lying. I think it was 275. Cause it was like, I did my set and then went to the bottom. Somebody started the prayer from the movie. And then when it was over 57 seconds is when I went back up. <laughs> <laughs> so I could not have done that at parallel, but I did it because I could. But I but I did it because I could sit on my calves, and then still generate enough force after that time to stand it back up. <laughs> so 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 angle is very important when it comes to those isometrics. Um, and then said so you have eccentrics. So said so we talked about those. Those are like your negatives. Remember, eccentrics have the highest amount of – they create the most muscular damage, so they need the most repair afterwards. Um, So they're fantastic for periods of, you know, if, like, your focus is muscular breakdown to to then have higher protein synthesis later so your muscles can build up more. So whenever you're in more of a muscle mass, hypertrophy-style phase, reaching fairly close to eat, like, you know, getting high volumes of eccentrics of eccentric fatigue like that definitely have a benefit for that assuming that you're doing the um the near like exhausting type of mass building work because you know there's multiple types so to speak um so that's almost more of like the bodybuilding or break or just very hey i break it down build it back up just lift eat repeat nothing else um so they're very big for that i said they're also big because 
they're what basically prepare your body for higher forces because it can it's the first one that can be exposed to higher forces and they're in control so you can do slow you can do slow eccentrics and just try to stay in control and work your ability to again work with that force or you can do faster eccentrics still under control but end up generating a, a more of a stretch reflex out of the bottom because of that stretch cycle uh, now the reason so, so those just happen to be the characteristics of the three now where this actually comes into i said like possibly using it to reverse engineer your sport is again look at your sport look at the position and see which one of these actually takes effect in what action and, and not just in the action but in the muscle groups themselves um for like and so this could be nearly endless. So, for example, um, we use like baseball as one. Throwing a baseball is a very like fast, loose eccentric because muscular activation will actually tighten down and slow down. Or like um, you're trying to trying to activate too many muscles will in essence slow down rotational speed and tighten like tighten the muscles up so very very low eccentric force um, but they need the ability to to cancel it abruptly and to, to stop the movement there's almost no there's no isometric whatsoever in baseball and then a very fast concentric motion as they go through the throw or the baseball swing like most shoulder injuries happen at um, for example, most elbow injuries happen when they're when they just reach the back part of the throw and they just start throwing it forward. Late that, that's most of exactly like they, they can't handle the torque. That's most of your elbow injuries. So, getting something that works at eccentrically at the elbow, like so like near that like limit point of elbow motion, and has a concentric coming out of it, can help elbow health. Um, so one of those places where like a lot of like forearm, like heavy forearm work, heavy rotational forearm work, like drills you might be able to do with like a sledgehammer or just like anything else, like even bands work. But then the shoulder in baseball players has the highest degree of injury when they're actually slowing the throw down after they've actually done the throw. So most shoulders aren't hurt during the throw. They're hurt during the bottom part of it when the arm is suddenly slow, like stopping. Think of skiing and, you know, when you have no idea how to slow down or stop. <laughs> it's like you're basically going through all that force and then you're near the bottom and you're like, oh, shit, I just have to, like, fall down. <laughs> That's basically what your shoulder is going through at the end of every single, like, max effort throw in baseball. Um, so making sure that it's work, that it's getting that high velocity, like, abrupt eccentric in that, like, helps. Um, so there's actually like an old school baseball like partner drill where one bit one player basically just has their arm up and a partner literally like throws their arm down and then you're just trying to like stop it and decelerate it. There are better drills than that, but that's that's like a very traditional drill that just shows the example of what we're talking about. Um, but then let's look at um, like we said with um what is it like soccer or like something like soccer or other flat surface very high running change of direction drills again not very much isometric but again they they need, you want to make sure that they have high velocity high power changes going from eccentric to concentric so this is why like plyometrics and explosive movements you know like olympic lifting but especially plyometrics have been shown to be so beneficial for your field running sports like soccer, lacrosse, field hockey, et cetera. Um, or those, or the, you know, like your, or football guys, not just for the performance, but because, you know, they're fast eccentric loading going into a fast concentric movement for performance, but also for injuries. You know, like when you're, um, when you're running, most of those, most of that impact, especially in change of direction, and most of those injuries that do happen, happen within the first 
uh, generally it's 0.15 seconds. Like if your body, if, if like your leg decides that it doesn't want to hate, that it's not happy with you when you're, when you're an athlete and you're like playing a sport, it generally happens within 0.15 seconds of that foot hitting the ground. So the ability to go into a fast eccentric, which is the exact same type of motion that's happening in your leg when it first hits the ground and it starts to absorb that impact and then trying to, trying to aggressively overcome it, which again, overcoming is your concentric motion, aggressively going from one to the other as quick as possible with the most force and in good alignment is huge because that's what keeps it intact. It's not just performance, it's not just performance, but it's also what keeps it intact at those points. So plyometrics, get that. That's why like, you know, again, it's not always only performance, but things like reaction time are huge. You know, how much like getting off those jumps as quick as possible. Like, it's not always about maximum height. It is usually about maximum height with maximum intent for speed. Um, but also you can start utilizing other motions. Like for example, taking a ham, say a hamstring, a hip, a hip dominant, um, like hamstring motion, say something like a glute ham raise and having it. And once they're strong enough to control the motion, having them also do some like faster eccentric to concentric motions can be very big for that because it, again, it's helping them, go into that fast eccentric and come out quicker concentrically. So like, um, it's always driven me nuts when I come across strength coaches who, again, like they see, they see the world of sports as being just way too black and white for my tastes. And conch side note, you see this all the time in like research based strength and conditioning programs. Um, Cause they tend to think that like, only the research matters or that it's like if it's not 100 percent what the research says and it's not then it's not going to work or not worth it and that drives me insane <laughs> like uh strength and condition like training is going to be all about understanding the black and white but then being able to see all the gray areas where it's applicable in between um and like i said last week and i always say everything that's ever been supported by research worked before the research supported it <laughs> so if you so if, if you have that idea then know that it like works so anyway so fast eccentrics is one of them that control if they're strong enough to be able to use it um basketball can look say basketball volleyball now look very similar to sports like soccer field hockey lacrosse changes in direction lateral movement jumping the fact that they're more that they have more start stop jump up come back down means that they need even more braking capacity like they need the ability to not just decelerate but actually put on the brakes even more so again that ability to go into an abrupt high force eccentric is even more important for those athletes than the running athlete and also the the eccentric we know very fast concentric because that's going to help them with their with their power uh, capacity, the actual jump, and then again high force eccentrics for when they're actually absorbing those absorbing those jumps because you know they're going to have more impacts than any other athlete. Volleyball and basketball, for the most part, they're going to have more jumping impacts. I mean, so their ability to their to absorb super high amounts of eccentrics over the course of a season is enormous. Um, take changing it up, looking at a sport like, uh, well, like football now, generally, as soon as you have, again, a higher amount of resistance, or especially if it's man versus man, you're going to have some, you're, you're going to have some, that's where isometrics come in as a specific quality. Cause like, uh, so especially if you're a lineman or oh, eccentrics also help with collisions, by the way. So the more your body's going to hit the floor <laughs> or something like that, then the, then the more your body can actually just um, absorb it when it's been exposed to a lot of eccentrics because it's literally your tendons and your ligaments, you know, just resisting and absorbing. So, but then you get man to man. That's when you start getting a lot more isometrics as well. So like your linemen in football 
or just any position with a high amount of blocking, you're going to go into that. And in you're trying to concentrically overcome that opponent. When they're pushing on you, you're trying to eccentrically resist them. But you're also going to have isometrics in between when you're kind of at that standstill until one of the over overcomes it. So, so, isomet so isometrics almost always come across in sports, uh, in man-to-man -man sports, as being a very important bridge in a fairly mixed together movement. So like a lineman or a wrestler is going to have a very even need for isometrics, for eccentrics, and for concentric strength, all three. Because if any of those three is weak, then that means they're going to have a point where if they get pushed there, then, then they lose. Like the lineman or the wrestler with very weak concentric strength is almost always going to have to be reactive to where the other opponent is putting him. He might still be able to do that with skill and speed, but he's going to almost always have to be reactive. But the athlete, the lineman or the wrestler or similar athlete like rugby player who, has, who is isometrically weak, he has either weak angles or just can't hold on to a position very well, is going to have to constantly be moving. And then the athlete who is eccentrically weak, like they might be able to have a lot of force at the get-go, but, but that once they hit that resistance point, they kind of crumble. They're going to be the one, you know, they, they look like they're in, in that competition. They look like they're in that fight, but then they suddenly just like fall off. They, you know, they, they suddenly drop off and the other athlete goes right through them. So in man-to-man -man sports, that isometric bridge between eccentric and concentric contractions is huge. And then you have a couple other random angle-specific, sport-specific uses as well, like say, um, like a shot putter, for example. You know, like that, the sh the the putt itself. Oh wait, no, the the shot itself. I always forget the shot is the actual ball. <laughs> so the shot is actual is you know you're holding it in a steady position. So the more, the more like isometrically stronger you are to have in that position, even though it's kind of anatomically stacked if you're doing it right, nevertheless, the more tension you can like just hold there easily to then be able to actually do your concentric force power through the throw, then, then the better you'll be when you like the better your throws will be. So, or weak points. So that's of course the other um, place to look at these, but Anyone got anything on that? They want to add, throw in questions, et cetera? Um, yeah, I like to think of, like, from, from a um, muscular contraction standpoint, I like to think of it also from a positional standpoint. So, like, those concentric uh, contractions, like, create the movement. Those isometric contractions will help control position, specifically of joints. And then, like, the eccentric um contractions help like control the movement so like if you were to do a bicep curl with a weight at one speed but then all of a sudden you're now you're doing a tempo uh, curl or something like that that has a lot to do with that like the, the neurological system communicating you know with the antagonist and, and controlling that movement um so that's how i kind of like to think of it sometimes too when it comes to uh muscles contracting what do you would you say i'm a lot like would you say i'm thinking in the right way there or? Oh, yeah yeah no you you definitely are yeah because like being able to control the control the movements around the joints keeping everything steady and, and i say it, it does all come come down to control for sure and it's crazy because you take athletes and they'll be on the, the more you're around athletes and it's not just sports it's like the, the more you're around people, you'll see people at completely different ends of the spectrum. Um, like some are super controlled and you have to get them to almost let themselves be looser and accept higher velocities. Some are the exact opposite. Like they're super loose. So they kind of naturally can generate some velocity because they don't have that tension, but they have almost no control. <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and you have to build that up. And I see, you'll, you'll see both of them. Um, I mean, actually, like, Jordan here is, is a great example because literally her and her sister. Like, Jordan has always, like, to use a squat, the squat as the main example, Jordan squatting has always been more controlled. And whenever it would come to, like, maximum, like, working on max power, the super high force, like, like just the highest intensity lifts, then 
she would generally need that extra coaching to go faster with it, to, to be a little bit looser and to create more of a stretch reflex, for example, going down in that quick eccentric and then coming up aggressively. Whereas her sister has always been the loose one. So she'll like just drop into a bottom squat, but it took her a while at first when first training um, to be to like actually have more control. So she'd go down there and she'd had that automatic stretch reflex right back out, but mm -hmm. it wasn't always the most controlled. <laughs> so she had to actually be like slowed down so she could build up that eccentric strength and control and, and make sure that she was doing it right and wasn't going to have any negative effects. So it's crazy. Yeah. Cause like, it's not that either and, and to go back to the strength coach thing, some, some strength coaches literally take that as one being right or the other one being wrong. And so that's just not the case. It's just noticing like what each athlete's strength already is or what their natural incl inclination already is. And then making sure that they're, you know, developing that, but then also developing whatever it is they need to balance it out into a, into a better complete package. Yeah. That's why that specificity of training comes in. Yeah. Cause like I said, like there are some coaches out there, you know, who they want every single movement to be like slow controlled every rep have a have a two second squeeze at the end you know like almost like old school high intensity training style mm -hmm. like there's still coaches like that um one of the one of the former wbu assistants like strength coaches was like that like everything had to have like a two second squeeze at the end of every rep and it and like that it's just like there's a reason your athletes aren't always getting like the most power because, because you're always training in this way. Yes. I wouldn't believe in, in doing that over a prolonged period of time. Cause you're literally teaching the body to react a different way to moving the weight. Yeah. That's it. But, but on the flip side, it's the same thing. Like when you get, you have some coaches who always want to see it just like as fast as possible and aggressive as possible. Those are usually the ones that are completely okay with athletes you know, like lifting their feet up, throwing their hips into a bench press or hip thrusting and reverse curling their max power clean, stuff like that. And yeah. they're okay with it because they're on the other end of that spectrum. Yeah, that's a spectrum you don't want to be on either end of. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was my empty coffee mug hitting the ground. Yeah, I do that like six times before I actually do something um, like that. Anything else? Anybody like a uh, cons? Jordan, Calvin. Well, um, I really enjoyed going through kind of those different uh, spectrums that we can place athletes on. Um, not sure if this is part of your current session, but are you going to be addressing like programming and periodization for these different athletes? Like, how do we combine all of this knowledge that we know? and then uh, deliver that into like, you know, an optimal training plan. Yeah, uh, thanks again. Thank you for asking that. I think that's gonna be either, it's gonna be one of the next two weeks. So Sweet. yeah, like I, I, I am trying to have these every week. Like, I mean, I'd love to get it to where this type of thing can happen all the time. Um, but definitely while things are slower every week is the goal. Uh, so yes, yeah, so actually, yeah, so one of the next two sessions, either next week or the week after, We'll definitely be on that. Okay. So, that sounds yeah, so, exciting. Yeah. So actually, uh, yeah. So as soon as, as soon as I kind of make that decision, because I have kind of like a list of ideas that I first started coming off of, and then with the first, with last week's class, so to speak, having on, I felt that yeah, like building on that one, and this would be a good step too. So that will be either either class three or class four for sure. Looking forward to it, Jerry. Thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited for that. So, thank you. Yeah, so, so a lot of this is trying to go into the words the, you know, text, textbooks have their limitations. So, you know, they, they get that information, but by definition, the textbook has to be very, you know, it, it's complete, incomplete, black and white. Like, you know, it doesn't have either, it, it was something like coaching and, perform, and human performance individuality is such a big thing 
you know, like delivery of training, like de delivery of practice is makes such a big difference. So like, plus just individual adaptation, like there's so many different things that they go into that that's where, honestly, for me, that's what has just always been the more exciting part about teaching to me is basically like finding all the gray areas that are almost never talked about and bringing those up. Uh, either because they're not talked about in classes or just like, um, I mean, some of the best ideas that I, like some of the best things that I ever learned and applied to, to, to training, I, I guarantee you came from me literally standing in front of a class and talking. And it, it's that whole thing where you like, you know, you, you find, you realize new things while you're going over them mm -hmm. just because of like the momentum you get from bringing them up and getting those things together. And I know that some of those have happened for me. And so bringing those up, like, um, th this is just that like last crate, like probably the last crazy, sto like random story, but that really exemplifies that is it's probably the same. I know that almost every single edition of the essentials of strength and of strength conditioning training or essentials of strength training, conditioning handbook, whatever it's actually called, you know, they like, it's the NSCA's book. It's what the CSCS is based on. And there's a section in plyometrics. This is my classic example. The there's one part that was always insanely confusing. And it's when it's talking about the minimal requirements to do plyometrics and training. And the textbook almost always has a chart and it, you know, it uses, it goes off squat and bench and it'll be like, okay, so to use plyometrics and training as you, your athlete as a female should be able to squat one and a half to two times her body weight as a male should be able to squat two to two and a half times their body weight. And it's like, wow, you have to be really strong according to this chart and guidelines to do plyometrics. Uh -huh. But like, and then I'll see and turn around and see some strength coaches. And again, like they take this, but never, they never think about it as anything other than black and white. So they're like, they're teaching a basic squat jump or like a knee tuck jump. And they're like, well, you should be able to squat at least two times your body weight before you can do this. Look, nobody needs to be able to squat two times their body weight before jumping up and tucking their knees. <laughs> it's like, that's not the way that human movement works, right? Yeah. Um, 100%. Yeah. And it's like, people know that intuitively, but if they're taught that, never taught, and, and never realize that, then they can just, they'll either toss it out because they think it's dumb, or they won't, or they'll, they'll be on the flip side and be like, well, you're supposed to be able to do this, so I guess there's a reason for it. Um, even worse, though, that same chart will say for bench, we'll say like, okay, female athletes should be able to bench three, 75 to 100% of their body weight. And to me, that's an even more impressive lift than the squat. Not the lift, but like a female benching her body weight usually takes longer than a female squatting one and a half times her body weight. You know, you just, as a generic, more often than not. Um, or like males, like one time the, or a little bit more of their body weight as well. But that's where, I don't know if the current versions of that chart and textbook still say this, but that's where I got confused for years because that same chart would say, you have to be able to bench this or be able to do five clap push-ups. It's like a clap push-up is a plyo. How can doing five clap push-ups, five plyos be a prerequisite to doing plyos? <laughs> Except that they didn't consider the neurological adaptation that would take place and the fact that like, you want that right, too. and like, and so this is what I'm talking about with teaching is like nowhere that I've ever seen in publication does it does it explain why it's so weird and confusing like that chart. Yeah. But Jerry, you'll be sorry. I mean, to cut you off. No, yeah. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no, it says like what the difference is. This one they took literally years for me of just figuring it. Cause I said like I knew it was intuitively intuitively something about it was wrong. <laughs> or misunderstood and that's when like years later finally realized that that is talking about your like traditional true plyometrics when like ply when like those plyometrics are like the true ply the quote-unquote true plyos like shock plyometrics like your highest intensity 
straight out of like Russia plyometrics, like depth drops off of, you know, 30, 36 inches, sometimes weighted depth drops. Like that's the type of plyometric that that chart is referring to. So what we have expanded on is meaning plyometrics, meaning any explosive exercises that uses a stretch reflex, like a clap push up or like different explosive body weight jumps. They're again, they're on that spectrum, but they are not what that chart and those strength prerequisites or suggestions are talking about. But yeah, that's, what, that's why they follow it up with um, persons over 225 pounds shouldn't drop more than 18 inches. That makes sense. Right. Yeah. Like, so nowhere is that stuff ever actually pointed out. (laughs) So so, uh, unless you either just kind of get that intuitively or have somebody or like, again, like come across it or finally have somebody tell you that can just be this like super confusing at best, possibly limiting belief system at worst. Mm -hmm. And I, and again, I've come across those. I have, I have worked with strength coaches and met strength coaches who would not use even basic body weight jumps with athletes until they were able to squat like two times their body weight. Oh, they're wasting so much and it's time. Like, oh my goodness. They're like, there are five-year-olds jumping, you know, like there's a reason five-year-olds jump. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. like, it's a basic human movement. Well, like, they got the best so like, that type of thing is what drives me nuts because it almost never comes across in class. Um, and that, actually I'm going to write that because like, I love a uh, plyos or another like, big geek love for me so the types of plyos and variations um so what separates like shock plyometrics depth plyometrics from the other like classifications of plyometrics that again like almost never make like classes or textbooks um if you guys like those of you guys who are really into it like uh, i'm assuming it's still a thing. So it's one of the only cases I've ever seen of a parent, you know, being a world renowned expert and then being replaced by their child. <laughs> um, but like uh, Yuri Verkashansky, you know, the, the basically the father of plyometrics, he was actually active until just a couple of years ago when he passed away. I, th- I feel like he passed away like two years ago or so, but his daughter Natalia Verkashansky, it's something, it's like Natalia or Natalie or something, is one of the biggest like experts on plyometrics now as well. And so like the, the way they break them down is it's awesome. So whenever I do plyometrics, I'll definitely go into that because again, it basically is one of those things that supported and then really glued together a lot of what you can already see in explosive exercises in plyometrics with a lot of like the other data and science that's out there about it. But like I said, because nobody ever talks about what each one actually means or pertains to specifically, it's kind of like a really confusing field. What was that name? I'm sorry. No, so just like Verka Shonsky, it's B-E-R-K-O-S-H-A-N-S-K-Y. You can probably either, if you, if you even get that, you can probably just type in like father of plyometrics and it would come up. And then yeah, it writing find, it, it looks a little more familiar now. <laughs> actually. Yeah. Um, and then it would be easy to probably find like his, uh, his daughter's stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's actually verkashansky.com and that's his daughter's like website now. Okay. Yeah, and, like I literally typed in father of plyometrics in Google and on my Google, the second thing was shock method, shock method and plyometrics by Natalia Verkashansky. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so um, anyway, so cool guys. I appreciate you guys being here and hanging out the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, appreciate you taking your time to conduct the session. You got it, man. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks for doing this, Jerry. We appreciate it. Um, thanks, Cam. I'm really, I'm really glad you joined this con. It's oh, fun. Happy doing. Um, yeah, I'm excited to um, sit in on the periodization and programming one as well. So cool, awesome. Um, yeah, I mean that's one that I mean shoot like I could, I could as I think about it, that could be like multiple sessions because you know there's just so many 
mm. pipes and way, again there's just so like, i i got into strength and conditioning from nerd basis like the almost infinite amount of variability in different ways to like try to create outcomes and the fact that there wasn't just one way is basically what drew me in here initially so 100 percent, i agree i agree there's more than one way to skin a cat <laughs> yeah so but, all right guys so again thanks again you guys have a good rest of the week and good night and yeah said so same time same bat channel that stuff next week is the plan but as soon as I have it for sure, then I will post. Then I will post that up again. Sounds All good. Right. Jerry, have a night, everybody. See you guys. Yeah. Bye bye.